Okay, the last session of the week. I'm sure you guys have had about as much information crammed into your little brains as you can stand, but give me another 45 minutes or so and I'll let you get on back to your lives. A um, couple of quotes for this last session. My, my, my favorite quote possibly in the world by Abraham Maslow. Who knows who Abraham Maslow is? Who's heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Okay, start at survival, work your way up through, all the way up to self-actualization. Okay, that's, uh, that's the same guy. He was a, uh, an American psychologist back in the mid-1900s. Mid uh, he also came up with the quote, you may have heard it before, maybe not. I suppose it is tempting if the only tool you have is a hammer to treat everything if it were a nail. It's simplified to, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. And that's real relevant in our in our world of you know wastewater treatment and troubleshooting and you know if uh, if all I have to sell you is polymers I'm going to use polymers to solve every problem you have if if I'm an equipment salesman I'm going to sell you equipment when maybe a biological change would be the same be a better solution um, if I'm a bug salesman I'm going to sell you bugs when nutrient might be a better a better idea uh, so what we want to do is kind of teach you guys the same mindset that I like for our people to have and that's you don't go in with any preconceived ideas you consider everything but just because you consider everything doesn't mean you have to do everything that's the other thing that happens sometimes is um, you get these upsets and I and it becomes what I call a y'all come you know everybody gets involved both on the on the customer side the client side and the supplier side and you've got your chemical vendor you've got your bug salesman you got your nutrient company you got your engineering companies you got your analytical labs and you are throwing anything and everything into it and you're using too many tools and so you know you've got to find that balance you know you want to you want to consider everything but that doesn't mean you have to do everything uh, the other quote that I use and this is from uh, uh, doing we talked about yesterday this is another one of his quotes learning isn't compulsory but then again neither is survival in other words if you're not learning new things then at some point you're gonna get stagnant and you maybe you're uh, you, won't, you won't still be in business or you won't still be around all right uh, we're gonna go in and talk about kind of how to address uh, ASB problems and what some of the things we can do uh, that's the troubleshooting poster that we have. Uh, I think everybody's gotten a copy. If you don't have, if you haven't gotten one already, they're available for you. Everybody should get one. Uh, it goes along with our ASB manual that uh, a lot of you already have. Um, <clears throat> and the the poster, which I'll get to in a minute. I think there's another picture of it. Let me make sure. Uh, maybe not. Let me go back to it then. Um, basically, the way it's set up is there's this is essentially the eight growth pressures. They're worded just a little bit different, and each of those has a number of items under it and those are action items or and they may be something to, to evaluate they may be something to do uh, maybe something to test and each one of those is um, on the list of uh, hierarchy of, of order of importance or of order of priority um, I've actually used this poster in one case where I had a client that had an upset a severe upset for a long time where they operated basically without their primary clarifier for about three or four months and uh, they were out of compliance for the bulk of that time and really a, a decision was made at a level well above anything I was dealing with was we're gonna have to keep running the mill we're gonna do the best we can and we're gonna you know bite the bullet and, and talk to the state and we're gonna deal with it and that's what they did. They they were at it. They had an NOV for two, at least two consecutive months, maybe a third month. And I, we sat down with the uh, the agency. They came and visited, and I, they invited me to sit down. And what I did is I brought out basically this poster, and I said, "Okay, here's all the things that we could have done, assuming this and listed all those 30 action items." And I went through each one and I highlighted the ones we did, and I put little red X's by the ones we didn't do. And then I talked about the ones we went and didn't do. In some cases, it was absolutely cost prohibitive. But more importantly, most of the time, it was something we just simply didn't have either the time or the wherewithal to do, or it was logistically impossible. So what we were able to do is we demonstrated that of those 25 or 30 items, we actually did about, probably about 18 or 20 of them. F fed peroxide, fed nitrate, fed bugs, did a tracer study, blah, blah, blah. The things we didn't do were things like put air in the back end of the pond because there's no electricity out there there wasn't really any way to do it so uh, it was actually received pretty well um, 
I don't know what the final outcome of any fines or anything, but it, it showed a good, a good amount of due diligence. Because when you have a non-compliance, a non basically there's three things that the agency really wants to know. Why did it happen? What did you do to minimize the impact? And what are you going to do, going to do so it doesn't happen again? You know, if you can answer those three questions you know, in good faith, that goes a long way in avoiding you know, punitive situations. So with that, let's talk about what we're going to deal with. And we're talking about the three big cures, or three big cures, three big issues with uh, ASBs. Elevated BOD, elevated TSS, and in some cases, benthic feedback on the back end. You can actually have all three of those at the same time. You can, and they can be interrelated, as I talked about yesterday, that sometimes your high BOD is actually because of your high TSS. <clears throat> We're going to have an overview of a number of things that you can do to try to minimize that, the impact or kind of reduce the uh, final, final impact of those problems. It might be load diversion. You might be able to manage level of your basins. Some people can, some people can't. Rental aerators, add supplemental oxygen, polymer peroxide, nitrate salts, nutrients, biogmentation. So we're going to kind of go through each of those and kind of talk about the pros and the cons <clears throat> and what I call relative impact uh, factors. With ASBs, the biggest problems are generally BOD and TSS. And as I said, often interrelated. We really want to focus on that soluble versus total BOD. I beat that, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but at the same time, you know, I can't overemphasize enough making sure that you understand whether or not your system is degrading the BOD or not. That's critical. Um, high loading or inconsistent loading is a major culprit. Uh, your system can handle a near, a near capacity loading all the time that averages just right below whatever your capacity is, actually better than it can being at half the capacity and 60% over the capacity and half the capacity and 60% over the capacity back and forth because what dictates how many bacteria I have in a system? How many bugs do I grow? Depends on the load. Absolutely depends on the load. So if, what happens if I, and this happens when you have an outage, but it also happens when you have a period of, of really good control sometimes. If your meal runs really, really good for a month, at a, a month in a row, and your loading is 20,000 pounds a day, and everybody's happy and everything's great, and it should, you, you should be, and you have a spike from 20,000 pounds a day to 50,000 pounds a day for you know, three days in a row, even though you've got the aeration capacity to handle that, what do you think happens to your bacteria? Well, if you're nutrient limited, it takes a long time for those guys to catch up. That's one reason to feed nutrient kind of all the time is to make sure that when you have these swings, your, your population that's been diminished through a, period, a good time is, is able to grow rapidly to, to come back. Um, so those inconsistent loads can be an issue. We want to look at those eight growth pressures or those critical drivers. Um, we want to look at flow patterns and detention times. Short circuiting can be a real problem, both in the settling zone and in the aeration area. Uh, always look upstream, look at the primary treatment, and make sure there's nothing we can do there. Uh, improve housekeeping and reduce loads and minimize spikes. That's easier said than done sometimes. But you know, it is always kind of interesting to me how when a, when a plant or a mill is you know, on the 18th day of the month and kind of projected to be potentially out of compliance if you know, nothing changes, how miraculously the flow goes down a million and a half gallons a day and the BOD loading goes down and nobody spills anything. Now some of that is because steps are taken that aren't sustainable. I mean there are certain things you can do with your you know, brown stock washers and things that you can probably do for a week or two that you can't do forever. But some of it is when, when, you, when push comes to shove, people go out there and they, they turn off wash down hoses and they pay attention to this and pay attention to that and as soon as the problem goes away, you know, it drifts its way back up. So, you know, anything we can do long term to keep, you know, to condition ourselves to minimize loading is, is beneficial. <coughs> then we also want to look at our what I call remedial techniques. What are the things that we can do, such as feeding nitrate or feeding peroxide or feeding polymer or feeding bugs that aren't something that we're necessarily going to do all the time, but we, we bring in the, the troops and try to make sure get ourselves through through that month. 
Um, every month, every the beginning of the next month, you always get a new do-over. You know, the interesting thing about compliance in this country is it's a 30-day window. And if you're going to have an upset, by the way, start it on about the 16th day of one month and carry it over into the next month because that way it gets spread out. Now, I realize you can't schedule them that way, but if you think about it, my opinion, permits ought to be on a 30-day rolling average. Now, I'm not sending that out. Oh, God, it's been recorded. <laughs> but, but seriously, if you think about the logic of it, you know, we, you, you get a 30-day window and you, you skate, skate in just under the, the limit. And the next month, you start out high and then you, you recover and you're good. But uh, it's, it's just sort of an interesting concept when you really think about it. But that's the way it's done and that's the way it is and you know, we just have to live with it. But what that does sometimes, it really puts the pressure on that last 10 days of a month trying to make sure you don't get that NOV for that, for that month. All right, these are, these are some of the things that are categories on, on, from the poster, if you will. When we've got a high effluent BOD, we've got either high loading, maybe insufficient aeration, uh, <clears throat> high hydraulic loading, which is not the same thing as high organic loading, though they kind of go hand in hand sometimes, insufficient nutrients, toxicity or inhibition, recalcitrant or hard to grade compounds, uh, short circuiting, benthic feedback, nit and nitrogenous BOD. This is very unusual, but you know, we've got at least one mill that we work with, and it's not the only mill, but it's the one that has it on a most recurring basis uh, of, of you get nitrogenous BOD. And what that is, is when you grow nitrifiers in your system and you've got some benthic feedback ammonia, the nitrifiers take that ammonia and consume oxygen with it in the BOD bottle. They don't necessarily do it in the, the plant. In fact, if they, did it in the, if they did it in the mill, it wouldn't be a problem. They do it in the BOD bottle. Well, every part per million of nitrogen or not, part per million of ammonia translates to about four or four and a half parts per million of, quote, BOD. So you can see real fast that if you've got 10 parts per million of regular BOD and you've got five parts per million of ammonia refluent and all five of this, that gets converted in your BOD bottle, that 10 carb carbonaceous BOD suddenly turns into a 30 total BOD. The state doesn't give you, you, know, you can't plead, oh wait, it's not really BOD. It, it is BOD. There are a few people that have carbonaceous BOD limits, but they also have ammonia limits. <laughs> so, uh, and that's the poultry, a lot of, some of the poultry industry in Mississippi, for example, they negotiated carbonaceous BODs, but in order to do that, they had to get an, a separate ammonia limit. So it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, <clears throat> in addition to the high BOD, we can also have high TSS. A lot of times this is due to poor flock formation uh, that can be due to dispersed growth, due to e increased loadings, or sometimes it can be due to sulfides or organic acids from, from uh, primary clarifier problems. Uh, you can also get it from nutrient deficiency where we just don't have enough nutrient to get that good flock uh, early in the system. And occasionally you can have flock that gets formed that gets deflocculated by a toxic shock. This would really only happen in ASB if it was a well mixed system, not plug flow. If you're plug flow, what will happen is you'll kill off the front as opposed to deflocculating the, the whole thing. Uh, if you had a complete mixed system and where your normal situation was a, more of a homogenous, well flocculated system and you had a big toxic shock, you could conceivably deflocculate the whole thing. Um, but most of you guys, most systems are fairly, fairly plug flow where if you had a really severe toxic shock, what's going to happen, you're going to see it in the front and it's going to dissipate before it screws up the whole system. Did you have a question? No. A uh, couple other common ASB problems. Um, BOD and t or TSS across the settling area. We see that sometimes. You'll hear people say their they're pond inverted or turned over. And that, can, that usually means that it's a temperature change and it can actually happen going hot to cold or cold to hot. But basically what happens, you get a temperature gradient and the stuff on the bottom and the stuff on the top kind of get mixed. And some of that benthic layer gets resuspended and uh, carry, it'll start carrying out. Uh, and so you'll see that. That's one of those things that unfortunately when it happens, there's not a whole lot you can do about it because it's happening in the back end of the system. Uh, you don't have any mechanism to go out there and feed polymer and try to mix it in. So you, you, you pretty much just have to live with it. But 
it's important to figure out that's what's going on because that tells a different story when your TSS goes up because of a turnover as opposed to your TSS going up because the basin's not working. Because if it's because of a turnover in the, in the settling pond, I don't say you just have to deal with it or live with it, but in a way, there's no point of going up and spending a whole bunch of money trying to make that basin work better when it may be working perfectly fine and it's just, you know, it's a, uh, an atmospheric condition and um, you know, try, to, try to make sure you get your brain around it and, do, and, and uh, address it accordingly. Uh, this is something we see a lot and unless you have an ammonia or phosphorus limit, it's not a big deal, but it happens in virtually every ASB out there, is that ammonia or phosphorus increase across the settling bonds, which is a, ponds, which is a, a, a byproduct of benthic feedback. As I talked about yesterday, when that sludge decomposes in the bottom of the pond, BOD gets released, but also nitrogen and phosphorus gets released, and uh, it will show up in the, in the uh, final effluent. Um, duckweed and algae. Uh, duckweed looks like little bitty lily pads. Uh, it's, it's more of a cosmetic thing. One of our clients has a mill manager that just hates the stuff. And every time he goes out to the ASB, he calls the, envir the environmental manager and says, you got to do something about the duckweed. Well, it's actually what? The yes. mill manager goes to the ASB? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this, this mill has a fair amount of public attention. It has a lot of tours. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, but and the thing is, and the, the the thing is, is actually duckweed is a pretty good indication of a healthy is of of low toxicity and healthy water, and in fact, somebody was telling me that they were it might have been at it was at that plant and they had the the one of the guys from the state was out there as part of one of these tours, and one of the first things he says, man, your water is looking pretty good. Look at all the duckweed. Yeah, so it's it's a uh, it's not a bad thing, but it does it can look really bad because if you get a lot of it and and it, it requires nitrogen because it's a plant, and so what will happen if you've got that ammonia in the feedback in the summer, those little suckers will grow all over the place, and it does it does look a little you know unattractive. It can't it's not really a problem unless it carries over, gets in your sampler, decomposes, and makes your BOD go up. So I mean it's but you but as far as it dying and causing a problem and generating the BOD, there's not a lot of mass to it. You know? Now, I don't have it up here, but there's another thing that people have in their basin sometimes called water hyacinth. And you guys has, have that sometimes. Water hyacinths are big and they, they were, in some places, people planted them on purpose trying to get nutrient consumption and BOD consumption. And theoretically it works, but what happens, you can't control it. And it grows and covers up the whole basin and then they start dying and there's one thing about having a little piece of duckweed die and decompose in the water. It's another thing about having 40 acres of lily pads and big hyacinth. And we have two clients that have issues with it and that I'm aware of. In both cases, they go out every couple of years and they bring in basically a harvester. And it's a piece of equipment that, that goes out there and harvests tons and tons of this stuff and pulls it out and hauls it off. And, I don't think there's a beneficial reuse for, purpose for it. I, I think they just haul it off and landfill it, as far as I know. Uh, then the last thing, I talked about it briefly yesterday, that, that shows up in some ASBs is purple sulfur bacteria. They require elemental, they require sulfide in the water. They oxidize it into elemental sulfur and they're autotrophic. So what, what can happen is they will actually create TSS in the basin um, and once that goes in a BOD bottle, they can actually decompose and, and create some BOD from, from atmospheric carbon dioxide. We only see it in a, some mills, but if you're ever, if your guys are ever running a TSS sample and they get pink, pink pads uh, from the filtrate when they filter it, uh, that's an indication that um, you've got purple sulfur bacteria. Okay, here's the, here's the poster um, in its un, uncovered version. High organic loading, uh, insufficient aeration, uh, pH and toxicity, not enough retention time, nutrients, insoluble BOD, which is basically TSS carryover, low temperatures, and benthic feedback. And then each of those categories we'll kind of go through pretty quickly and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So if you get, take a look at that chart, <clears throat> these are those, each of these, that's what those are. For, so for, for excessive organic loading, these are the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things to look at or do. And the way you read this, this 
table, or not table, the way you read this list is M means monitor or measure, okay? ST means short term, LT would be long term, and if there's an MT, it would be medium term. HI means high impact, uh, LI would be low impact, and VI would be variable impact. Now, let's I'll kind of go through and explain how that works. So, excess organic loading. Well, if you're not already using something to monitor your BOD more closely to real time, like COD or TOC, you need to do that. Okay, that's how you find out ahead of the game that you're going to have a loading issue. So that's an M. It doesn't change anything. You know, starting to measure BOD, starting to measure COD when you haven't been measuring it, doesn't change the problem you've got. But it, it's something that's important so you can better troubleshoot. Minimize organic loading by either diverting or bleeding. You know, divert it somewhere and then bleed it back in. That's something that can be done very quickly. Okay, if you can do it, and it's a high impact, immediate impact. Okay. The minute I take BOD out of the system, that's that much less BOD that's got a chance to pass through. It takes loading off the system. So that's short-term high impact. Reduce flow. Anything I can do to reduce flow, same thing. It immediately improves the performance of the system. It gives the bugs more time. Short-term high impact. I might be able to improve primary clarifier removal by putting some polymer in there very quickly. That can usually be implemented pretty quickly. You get your you get your water treatment guy out there, run some jar tests, they can get a toad in there, and within a day or so, you, you know, you're feeding polymer. The impact, though, could be very, very, very variable. Uh, in some places, it might have a big impact if there's a lot of fiber that's carried through and creating some BOD. But if, you, if, if the system only removes 15 or 20 milligrams per liter of TSS, that might be not enough to do you any good. Monitor performance and recovery using the microscope and the DOUR testing. Do something more real time, again, some of you may already be doing that. If you're not, you know, the upset is not really the best time to start doing something like that, but it's better than not doing it at all. Um, the problem with microscopy is if you've never run it when the system looks good, you don't really know what it's supposed to look like. You know, I know what it's supposed to look like compared to the other 50 mils I've been in, but if I've never seen yours when it looks good, shoot, yours may always look a certain way. Even, you know, your good and somebody else's good are not necessarily the same thing. Looking at biogmentation, that's something that can be done very quickly with the back end. It, we'll call it moderate impact. You know, in some cases, it could have, it could have a, a decent impact. In some cases, it might not have an impact. Um, <clears throat> direct oxidation with hydrogen peroxide, that really doesn't have much of an impact. Uh, in term, you know, it's something you can do very quickly, and a lot of people do it because it's a nice lever to pull. And it's a nice thing you can tell your boss that, hey, we're throwing some peroxide out there. The data suggests that, with most exceptions, you're really not getting a lot of direct oxidation. Okay, insufficient aeration. Minimize the loading, okay? Less loading I have. You see there's some carryover for some of these things. Getting the loading down is, is pretty much, you'll see it up there four or five times because that is the one thing you can do <laughs> to help turn your system around that's absolutely foolproof. Uh, perform dissolved oxygen measurements or profile. Well, that's not gonna change the upsets you're having or the problems you're having, but it's good information to have and you need to know that. Uh, Maximize aeration. It's kind of a no-brainer, but you know, if, if you've got 35 aerators and only 32 of them are running, you know, get those other three going. Acquire or rent additional aerators. That's not something that's as easy as it sounds sometimes. One, if they're, you know, it may take a week or two to get them there. And the bigger issue for a lot of mills is they, if they could have more aerators, they would already have done it, but they don't have the electrical system to support it. Um, so a lot of a lot of mills are, are electricity limited, and then so then what you're talking about is not only renting aerators but renting generators and spending tens of thousands, if not in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars for diesel fuel for you know if you, particularly if it lasts more than a few weeks. One of the mills a few years ago, the number I heard was they spent half a million dollars in about a three month period on, on diesel and, and generator rental. Um, <clears throat> you can run you can run a fair amount of electricity for half a million dollars, <laughs> but unfortunately, after the upset's gone, the 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 uh, assumption becomes well we're not ever going to have that problem again. So and then two years later you have that problem again. But that's that's another story. Uh, supplemental oxygen via either calcium nitrate or hydrogen peroxide, and this is where peroxide has has the the potential benefit. Uh, it's something that can be done very quickly. It's it's I say low impact, it's actually pretty good impact, but it's a lot of dollars per impact point. <laughs> In other words, nitrate works really well, 
but it cost about 10 times as much as the electricity to generate if you could have permanent aeration. Now, when you start comparing it to rental aerators, it's probably still a little bit more expensive and not as guaranteed effective, but it's, it's much easier and, and quicker. So, um, yes. You said hydrogen peroxide works because it dissociates into O2. Yes. Right? Okay. Yes. It, under extreme, more extreme pHs, it actually, it, it can dis disassociate into radicals, OH radicals and H plus radicals. And in those cases, it actually will go after molecules and start breaking things down. But in the, in the typical wastewater pH range of, you know, six to eight, very little direct oxidation occurs. Uh, okay, we've got insufficient retention time. Again, no brainer, reduced flow. Uh, tracer study or basin profile. Well, again, that's not the thing you do in the middle of the crisis. You, you do that when, when things are lined out and doing normal, but having that, that, that data and that information over time is useful. Install baffles, again, that's, you know, that's Carl's area. You, know, you don't call Carl up and say, hey, can you get me a baffle delivered tomorrow so we can, we can stop the flow? You know, you're talking a, a survey of some sort where they have to go out and do some, either take our depth study or they actually ha have a little, you know, they've got to have a little bit more specific information for a very, you know, narrow range where they want to put it. And then it has to be manufactured and installed. So you're talking a couple of three months probably. Um, dredging, um, that's a little bit more long-term. Again, high impact. If you need more retention time, digging the hole bigger is pretty, that's kind of, it's pretty obvious that'll, that will help you get there. The time to dredge though, isn't while you're facing a TSS violation on the back end of your pond. You know, the, the last thing you need is to go out there with a dredge or a, a backhoe and stir up more solids. Um, Raise water levels. Some people can do that. A lot of people can't. Um, you, they can't. Well, I don't know. If they, you really can't um, change water level. You can change it in the aeration basin, but that's only a little bit. Can you guys adjust yours? Yeah. About six inches. Yeah. But over forty-three acres. I mean, that's yeah. Water. Yeah, that adds. That'll add a few hours or a day. It won't add a day probably, but you know. Um, but you, the thing is, you can figure that out. Okay, 43 acres is X many gallons per foot, and say, so, okay, at this flow, we're going to add six hours or 12 hours. Um, and and the thing is, is you know, by all means, that's a good thing. I mean, it's easy to do, and it has does that very quick impact. Um, I don't know. Most people, this is highly unlikely to happen in any of the mills that I work in, uh, with a couple of exceptions. One is a Canadian mill that we work with. And they have really deep basins. And a few years ago, they had an upset. And one of the first things they did was they, they made the water deeper to increase their retention time. What happened was, in their case, they have 22 foot deep basins. Well, surface aerators only go down. They only pull water from so far down. And what they ended up doing was creating about a four foot blanket of sulfide producing anaerobic zone. And actually created a, they kind of created their own problem. They solved one problem. They increased retention time, but in doing so, they created a toxicity from the H2S. So, you know, there, there's a little complexity sometimes that, you know, that you get unintended consequences. Uh, Biogmentation, you know, again, depending on the situation, could, could uh, uh, have some impact in, in trying to make that system work faster up front. Uh, insufficient nutrients, make sure that we're feeding the right amount of nutrients for the loading. Uh, measure residuals and increase the NMP as required. If you're using a blend, adjust that blend. Uh, these two right here are really only relevant for the really higher uh, mixed liquor uh, systems. In other words, people, places with ASBs with TSS higher than 500, so that doesn't apply to that many ASBs. Um, if we have a problem, this is where getting to figure out whether you've got a soluble or insoluble uh, situation. If you've got insoluble BOD, that's where increasing the water level can really have an impact because that increases your settling time. If you can increase the water level in the settling part of the thing. You know, in your case, Steve, you only have one basin. So when you increase water level, you increase everything. Uh, but if you've got a separate settling pond, um, uh, the Pine Hill Mill is a real good example. They can, they can actually change the level of their settling pond, I think about eight or 10 feet. They can go from almost, and, and for years there was kind of a running battle between the mill manager and the environmental manager about the best way to operate the pond. Are you better off operating the pond at a high level and maximizing settling time so you're always producing the best water possible, 
or are you better off running it at a low level so that when you screw up, you've got a week of holding water? And there's not necessarily a right answer to that. There's, it's two different philosophies, and that was and neither of those gentlemen are still there, but that was almost a, a constant battle whenever the system would, whenever they would start approaching an upset type situation, you know, one guy would want to increase the level and one guy would want to decrease the level, and you got to figure out which, which horse you're going to ride at some point. Um, uh, a few people can alter their takeoff point, uh, not very many, but you know, in some cases where you've got uh, purple sulfur bacteria, for example, tend to be at the top. So if you can take your if you can actually take your effluent off maybe a foot or two below the surface, you might you might miss those. Not many people can do that. Uh, there are times that people have added polymer as a settling aid. It almost has to be a situation where your settling pond is a separate uh, pond where all the water kind of goes in through one flume or one pipe where you can put the chemical in there and get some mixing. It's very, very difficult to put uh, polymer out into a, a large basin, even if it's got some mixing in it, and get the kind of mixing you need to make a coagulant work very well. Uh, all right. Low temperature, uh, minimize loading, try to take the loading off because, you know, and this is where, you know, there's a number of mills that we work with that only feed nutrient in the winter. Uh, because in the summer they have enough activity just from the natural uh, background and, and the growth rate. Uh, so low temperature, trying to give it a little bit of a, a boost is, can be useful. Uh, benthic feedback, you know, making sure we know what's going on as far as BOD, COD, and ammonia. You know, dredging the solids out on a regular basis to minimize that potential for benthic feedback. And then there are places where uh, you can do post aeration to, to kind of re, re degrade, if you will, or uh, any BOD that's fed back. Uh, but that's got to be in a situation where you've had some settling beforehand and you're aerating right at the effluent or fairly near the effluent because if not, you lose your settling and then you defeat the purpose. So it's, you, know, you got to have a pretty decent sized settling pond to, to, for, to make that work. Uh, toxicity inhibition, check and adjust the pH, that's a no brainer. Run feed and fed and unfed DOURs or use respirometry to, to look for, for respirometry or look for uh, toxicity. If you have some suspected uh, problem, identify that source and correct. And that's where Dr. Lang's stuff comes in using, using his, his techniques. Uh, one comment about biogmentation. Adding biogmentation when your system is under a toxic attack doesn't help. You know, these, the bugs in the bucket are no more susceptible, are, are mo no more, uh, um, unaf huh? Resistant. resistant, thank you. <laughs> no more resistant to um, quaternary mean toxicity than the guys that are already out there. You know, here's some of the things that people can do in, in times of crisis. Water conservation, I mentioned, I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, I think we've talked about all these actually, so I'll, I'll, I'll pass through this one. Yeah. Uh, short term versus sustainable, we talked about that. Water level management, I think we covered that pretty well. Uh, rental aerators and supplemental, uh, I think we covered that. But this is kind of gives you a good reference to go back with. Um, I just want to make sure there's nothing here we missed. Polymers, uh, they, they work in primary clarifiers. It's just a matter of making sure that the cost effectiveness is there. If you're spending, you know, if you're spending $100,000 a year on polymer to, to reduce your BOD loading by 10 milligrams per liter, it may not be money well spent if you're, if you're getting a you know, 100 milligrams per liter TSS reduction, it could very well be money well spent. Um, okay. I think we have already talked about peroxide pretty well. We talked about nitrate pretty well. As a comment, it's, it forms that extra thing. It works. It's about 10 times the electricity uh, cost for aeration. Uh, the, we, we provide a fair amount of nitrate in the course of a year for people that are having upsets. And the, the advantage to it over hydrogen peroxide is it's very, very safe. Um, it's easy to handle. You can slug in a whole truckload at a time or you can feed it in really easy. If a worker gets some on their hands, it's not a big deal. Um, peroxide's a whole different, a whole different situation. Um, it's not your mother's 3% peroxide that you put on a cut. It's 30 or 50%. And if it gets on you, it'll eat 
holes in your skin and things like that. So uh, you know, that's, that's the reason we actually have kind of migrated toward it as, as our uh, chemical of choice when we're doing these things in the back end of these ponds because you know, some, some of these ASBs are very large, they're very spread out, they're very remote, and so uh, you know, handling something that's, that's safer can be an advantage. Uh, okay, I think I've, oh, here's a, just an important uh, number you can put in your head. Every pound of nitrate nitrogen that's utilized is, allows 2.8 pounds of BOD to be consumed. So you've got that for future reference if you want it. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about bogmentation, which, uh, like I said, should take us to pretty much the finish of the day. And uh, bogmentation was invented, if you will, probably, oh, I don't know, in the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s. In fact, a very good friend of mine who I was playing flag football with that uh, I lived in Baton Rouge came to me one day and he was an oceanography major, or marine biology, something like that, and he hadn't been able to find a job. He just graduated from LSU, and he was working for a la local landscape company, just you know, doing labor type things. And I was working as a chemist for I think Dow at the time. And he comes to football practice, black football practice one day. He was all excited. He got a new job. I'm going, that's great, George. What are you gonna be doing? He says, I'm gonna be selling bugs. Well, I was a chemist working in a, you know. A, chemical plant. I didn't have any wastewater experience at the time. I didn't know anything about biological systems. I didn't. He said selling bugs and I, I was like thinking of all sorts of, you know, what are you selling? You're like selling ants or bit bugs? I had no idea what a bug was. Thing is, he didn't either. <laughs> you know, all he knew is he had a job working for this guy. He was trying to explain it to me. And you can imagine after one interview that he was going to be, well, they take these bugs, these bacteria, they put them in buckets and they take them to wastewater plants and they throw them in there. And, and that was my first experience with biogmentation. Little did I know that it would be like 15 years later before I actually had anything to do with it beyond that. Um, it's been around since, like I said, late 1970s. Uh, and basically what it started out as is if we can just find the right bacteria, we can solve all the problems. You know, all we have to do is put the right species of bacteria in there and it'll fix everything. And I hope if I haven't accomplished anything else in the last, you know, two days, the understanding that without the right growth pressures, it really doesn't matter what bugs you throw in or if you throw in bugs or whatever. It's a growth, pro growth pressure driven process. It's not a species process. Just like, you know, that'd be like saying, I'm only going to hire blonde haired male employees to build my cars or something like that. And, and if you didn't have the right process to build the cars, it wouldn't matter what kind of employees you hired. Well, I can hire, put my, you know, whatever kind of bugs in there I want to. And if I don't have the right process, if I don't have enough oxygen, I don't have enough nutrients, it won't matter. Now, does that mean that adding supplemental bacteria is useless? No, it just means you've got to do something in the right context. And, and that's, that's where the, the technology started out on the wrong foot and stayed on the wrong foot. In some cases, it's still on the wrong foot. Um, the idea that we can shift the population, that we can make the system do what we wanted to, that we can wrestle it into compliance simply by throwing in more and more bacteria, cost a lot of mills a lot of money and cost the industry of biogmentation a, a lot of credibility over the years. So with that rambling introduction, what are we talking about? We're basically talking about something pretty straightforward. Simply applying external bacteria of non-indigenous bacteria, or possibly non-indigenous, they can be indigenous actually, to a wastewater treatment system to enhance the performance. In other words, we're bringing in some more workers from somewhere else. There's a number of ways to do that. You can go down the street and get some from the local municipality or the local paper mill that's down the street from your mill or a refinery. You can, uh, you can take, bugs out of your own system, grow them up and put them back in, which you know, indirectly we actually do that in our system sometimes. Um, or you can buy commercial bacteria and put them in the system. Those are all examples of biogmentation. Some applications for the technology, and this one actually is very widely used for lift stations and grease traps throughout, you know, shoot, 
hundreds, not hundreds, thousands or tens of thousands of restaurants and hospitals and kitchens throughout industrial kitchens use uh, different biological products. The, the liquid Drano, it's an enzyme biological product. Ridex, uh, I mean, there are, there are dozens and dozens of products out there that are basically very similar to the stuff that we've got over there in the buckets. It's just they're used for, for other applications. And it works very well because in these cases, we've got a concentrated, controlled environment that we're throwing stuff in, and, and it's easy to prove or not. If it helps, it helps. If it doesn't help, it doesn't help. Interestingly enough, there are certain parts of the country where they don't allow that, and there's a debate uh, of, of whether they're right or wrong. I kind of think they're right. The bugs don't eat the BOD. They liquefy the, the grease. In other words, what, what they do if they don't do that, they bring a sucker truck in, they suck it out, and they take it to a municipal plant and dump it in, and the municipal plant treats it. Well, or they take it somewhere and reclaim it or whatever they do. Well, if you put the bugs in the sewer, what you do is you, you liquefy it. Where does it go? It goes to the wastewater plant. And so certain cities have actually banned the use of biological products because it actually increases the load to their wastewater plant. Now, the people that sell it sometimes say, no, 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 it, it, it degrades the BOD in the pipe between, before it gets there. The, the math doesn't add up when you really look at it. There's got to be some oxygen in there. There's got to be some electron acceptor. There's got to be something to make the grease do more than just liquefy. But it's a, it's a very widely used technique, and it works, and it works, like I said, it works for grease traps, it works for drains. Um, nitrification is, a, is a, a situation where we're trying to reduce the excess ammonia. It's really not a fit in the paper industry. Uh, enhanced BOD removal, and this is where in ASBs we, I call it kind of playing the numbers game, making a bigger army, because the more bacteria we have, the more work we can do in a given amount of time. So this is, this is very much an ASB application, and it kind of goes hand in hand with improved settling. If I can, if I've got an ASB that looks like this, and in two scenarios, in, one, in both cases I have 400 milligrams per liter BOD coming in, and we're gonna partition this off in, in this is an aeration basin, this is an aeration basin, and this is a settling basin. And my BOD is 400 in here, it drops to 200 in here, and in, in dropping to 200 in here, what's happened to my TSS? And I'm gonna make this a kind of an unusual, or a, an atypical application. This is my BOD, and for the sake of argument, I'm gonna say my TSS is zero. I've got the world's best primary clarifier. It makes my math simple, okay? So if I take 400 BOD and turn it into 200 BOD, how much TSS do I have? Hmm? More. more what? How much more? About 40%. We're going to make it easy. We're going to make it 50%. Okay? So I've got 100 TSS here. All right? Now, in this basin, I'm going to take this 200 down to 50. All right, now I'm gonna take this 200 down to 100. Okay, so now my, my TSS has gone to roughly 150, right? And then I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna have maybe a little bit more BOD, because there's gonna be a little oxygen carryover and I'm gonna drop my BOD down to maybe 80, coming out, BOD. 80, and what's my TSS going to be? Well, hopefully it settles out, yeah. but that's a pretty high soluble BOD, so I may have 120 TSS. In other words, I may not get good settling because I didn't really get complete BOD removal. All right, let's take another example. I'm going to use the same graph. I'm just going to put some numbers in blue. Still got 40 coming in, but I'm able to, and, and again, I use nutrients and bacteria somewhat interchangeably. I do something to make this basin more robust. And assuming I've got enough oxygen in there to handle this, and, and we're gonna assume I do, my 400, I take this down to 100 right here, BOD. Well, this is now gonna be a TSS of 150, 
And if I create my TSS way back here, it's going to have two sections to stabilize, get more dense, make more flock, etc. Here, I'm going to come out of here. I'm going to come out of here maybe. Now I'm going to come out of here maybe at 50. And I'm only going to make a little more solids, 175. And in fact, sorry, TSS. And in fact, some of these solids that were created here are actually going to oxidize. Remember when they run out of food? So even though I remove some more BOD, I might end up with very little net increase of solids. I go to my settling basin, it goes down to 40. And now I've got something that instead of settling down to 120, it might settle down to 50 TSS, 50 BO, 40 BOD. So my effluent clarity here. So any, and this, what we want to do is the more work we can get early in the system, whatever mechanism that takes, more air, more bugs, more nutrient, or some combination thereof, the earlier we can make this stuff happen, the better solids we can make, the better flock we create, the better effluent we make on the back end. Okay, so that's why TSS is kind of in here, or this improved settling idea goes hand in hand with the improved BOD removal. Um, okay, I'll skip the oil and grease degradation. Plant startups, recovery from toxic shocks. Um, we've basically got three groups of people that use bacteria and ASBs. You got people that do it all the time for one reason or another. Their, their system is overloaded under design, under stress. Uh, they, they've got a lower permit than most people. Uh, they don't have a tolerance for bouncing up near the, near the area. So there's, there's a number that do that. Then there's some that feed seasonally because their permit in the summer is lower, their permit in the winter is lower, their system doesn't work as well in the winter. And then there's the ones that we only do anything for upsets and outages. You know, we bring, and, and, and that's, and all three of those are very valid things, and we've got certain meals within your organization that they don't need it all the time. But but when it's out, it's time. In fact, it used to be we would send a back unit. Finally, we figured out that for what we charge to send a back unit there, you can just leave one there all the time for you know another another couple thousand dollars. So we've got them pretty much in all the meals now, where they and even if they don't use them all the time. Um, so um, that's kind of the, where all this comes in. Um, there's a lot of other things that people claim that biogmentation can do. A lot of people say we've got a bug that eats sludge. Well, that's kind of a stretch because what are those things in there? They're already stabilized bacteria. If they were easily eaten, they'd be eating themselves all the time. So uh, there's, there's a lot of claims of things that you know, put, feed our flock forming bacteria, they'll, they'll keep away your filaments. Well, there's not any real science behind that. Um, I'm not saying no one's ever put some in there and the filaments went away, didn't go, and the filaments didn't go away, but there probably isn't a real scientific cause and effect to that happening. So as I, as I mentioned kind of at the start of this, a little bit of a reality check. The quality and quantity of, bio, of the microbiology in a treatment system is a direct function of the environmental conditions, the organic loading, and the process control strategy, not vice versa. In other words, you can't drive these things by playing around with the microbiology. The microbiology is the end result. The bacteria will adapt and respond, but not, it's not going to change those growth pressures. We can increase the number of bacteria in the system to better respond to the growth pressure. And in some cases, with real small systems, we can do a little bit of this biologically based engineering. But once you get above about 100,000 gallons a day, it really becomes possible, impossible. But with, some, with those units over there, if you've got a 50,000 gallon a day system, we can actually feed more bacteria out of there than would actually grow in a day. So we, we, with some meat packing plants and things, we, we can do some of that. But that's a, that's a far cry from a 10 million gallon a day paper mill or a 40 million gallon a day paper mill. Your, your dynamics are just completely different. Um, you know, biomutation is very low risk, which is a good thing and a bad thing. The good thing is, is yeah, we can throw some bugs in there, it won't hurt anything. Worst thing to do is happen is nothing. But because of that, it got used in some very aggressive, very impractical ways. I've watched bugs get crop dusted a couple of times, which is pretty fun. Not, oh, actually, um, the time I saw it done, it was someone else's product. We were actually at the mill trying to get the bug business, and I watched $14,000 worth of bacteria get fed in eight minutes. And I will be willing to wager that less than 10% of the bacteria actually ended in the pond because the wind was blowing the stuff everywhere. Um, we had a client that insisted on crop dusting some of our bugs 
about three years ago. They'd done it once before, they thought it worked, and they were our, our customer, and they asked if, we, if they could do it, and I said, I don't think it'll work. And he said, well, we're gonna, we want to buy some bugs and do it. Well, we have to, we have to make them separate, different because we can't put them in the little bags. you got to make it in bulk. And so we were able to get it to them, and they did it. And, you know, I, <laughs> they bought them, so they can do what they want to with them. But, um, yeah, it, I, it has been done a few times. But it's really, it's, one, it's for show. It's, it's so you can tell the mill manager and the vice president of the division, we literally did everything we could think of. <laughs> uh, so... What, we, what we're trying to do is what we call inoculant level dosage. In other, word, in other words, we are dosing at a rate that is actually a high enough concentration that inoculates a system where if you were starting a system from scratch, it would, it would be high enough to, to, to continue. And that, that's about 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th colonies. And if you do all the math of all the stuff that those units put out, it inoculates, depending on your flow, at about 10 to the 5th to mid 10 to the 5th. In other words, 100,000 bacteria per milliliter of water. And, and so basically what that does, it says is if nothing comes in from the mill that day, you'll at least have something in there out there to, to do some work. <clears throat> and again, that's because if you just simply put the dry product in there, it's, it's, it's not, you can't do that with dry product. You can't feed enough to, inoculate, to get um, inoculation level dosing. Uh, we want to focus, product efficacy is pretty much a given. I mean. If you don't have a decent product, you don't have a decent product. It's, but you know, we got to make sure we have, apply it right. We have to have some realistic expectations. You'll never hear me say, "I'm going to feed your bugs. Your BOD is going to go down from 50 to 12." Um, you know, it's just it's just another tool. Uh, the, the, the field support and the defensible economics. I can defend you know X dollars or so. I can't defend thirty-seven thousand dollars a day. Um, much as I, you know, some people would love to do that. Um, it's just not defensible. It's not, it's not rational or reasonable. Um, so we've talked about this, so I'll go through that. We've talked about the back unit. Uh, we're reaching that, that growth rate. Uh, that's the old units. You know, we try to reach that growth rate 16 to 20 hours, maximize the growth. Uh, the systems are on a kind of a tenuous feeder, so they, they continue to, to dump product. Um, you could actually have them on a 16-hour cycle, but it doesn't fit into the way shift schedules work. <laughs> um, so, you know, you do things sometimes for scientific reasons, you do things sometimes for management reasons. Um, and that's just, again, that same graph. This is what it looks like under the microscope. This is, this is, this is kind of interesting, actually. Believe it or not, that picture, those little dots, that's actually a sample of five million bacteria per milliliter. <laughs> and that's what it looks like at time zero, right there when you put the, the bugs in there and kind of stir them in water. That's what it looks like four hours later. In other words, it hadn't really done much of anything. I think this one, I think the kiss one, yeah, it came out at 10 million bacteria per mil. So yeah, there's maybe twice as many if you look real close, but this is roughly a thousand times that concentration. Um, and this is what it looks like at 24 hours. This is about 5 billion per mil. And we get, that's what we're kind of shooting for, about a billion or so or a little bit more. Uh, um, this is just some guidelines. I'm not going to go through it, but uh, how we decide which size unit and what the inoculation rate is. So if you're at a, a 50,000 gallon a day system and you only put in one bug, ba bag of bugs and you have the little baby back, that's a million p bugs per mil. So it's a pretty good inoculation rate. By contrast, if we take that big unit and put 50 pounds a day in there and grow it up all we can, we're going to hit the mid 10 to the fifth. We, you know, that, that was the reason for building those two stage units, is that's the only way we can come close to getting uh, high 10 to the fifth for a 40 billion gallon a day plant. It's got a, it, that's the two stage unit, it's the only way to do that. Um, just a couple of little case histories that, that go along with this. Um, this is from a newsprint mill. Uh, this is the one that has the, the parallel systems that I mentioned. Uh, and they also have secondary clarifiers after them. Instead of their, their once through systems of secondary clarifiers, uh, the guy that designed it ought to be hunted down and you know, beaten. Uh, they've had a history of, of challenges because it's just, it's a very unforgiving system is the nicest way I can put it. Um, they, you know, most, you know, they're the only ASB I know that feeds polymer into their, to their secondary system. 
you know, nobody feeds polymer to their final settling basins, partly because they don't need to, but also because it doesn't, there's nowhere to feed it. These guys feed polymer, or they used to feed polymer a lot. I don't think they, they don't need any more. Uh, they tried literally every bug company known to man. Uh, they were one of our clients in my former job. Uh, they were always, you know, always trying to find that magic silver bullet. Uh, we, we started working with them. We put in a, we have a few systems that are actually 500 gallons we used to make. Um, we put it in. Uh, we were able to go from where they were just throwing bugs in to, to drive the system or try to uh, increase the counts by quite a bit. Uh, which for almost a year without feeding any polymer, they cut the nutrient in about half, and this is what the data looked like. Um, this is uh, the one supplier, half a year of two different suppliers. Uh, the the second supplier, they lost all their data for 2009. When I say they lost all their data from 2009, they lost all their data from 2009. <laughs> um, don't. Ask me why, I don't know. We couldn't, and uh, then, so this is influent, I'm sorry, this is influent BOD, this is the effluent BOD. So loading, average loading was uh, COD of 500, effluent BOD of 30, roughly 30. This little red bar here, that is the point at which they would be out of compliance uh, based on their average flow and, and that BOD. What this showed is that for that entire year, they were either out of compliance or within 10% of compliance pretty much every month for 12 months in a row. Uh, the next year they did better, the next year they did better, but they're still bouncing up around here. The year 2010, they're back in that same situation where they're on average out of, the, out of compliance or out of compliance several times. Um, this is their loading. Uh, the 2011, which is we got involved, uh, the actual loading was the highest that it had ever been at 800 milligram per liter loading. The BOD ran 18, next year it was 20, the next year it was uh, down to 12. Uh, and that time the loading had dropped, but it really wasn't that much lower than it had been in 2005 when their average BOD was, was six. So this was, this was a, a good, well, there's a lot of good data around this plant. And really the only thing we did differently was we just grew lots more bugs than what they had been able to do in the past. And in that case, they need that because they only have two day retention time in those basins and then they're it's very important, this logic right here, it's really important to them because they don't have a big selling basin. They've got clarifiers. So, and they actually have, their, their ponds really look a little bit like this. They're two, they're, they got a baffle down the middle, two sections of the pond. And if you can imagine, instead of a selling zone, they just simply have a clarifier. That's basically what their system looks like. All right. And then this is when we put in the Two-stage system, uh, this is, and this But as soon as uh, uh, pipes start to break, a lot of air can go through a two-inch line that doesn't have the diffuser on the end of it anymore. And that's the thing, one of the things that them, along with other people, struggle with. Then uh, they've got a big quiescent basin. The original system we were feeding, we had two of the back 225s. Uh, we were feeding 50 pounds a day, 25 in each one. And these are the same systems that you saw. Uh, So I'll get to it in a few minutes. Uh, this is the new system that we put in, just like you saw yesterday. Same thing. That's just some pictures of it in the field. And this is the comparison. Uh, eight, 50 pounds a day versus 18. 
this system produced 4.3 times 10 to the 15th, which is four quadrillion. The system here produces a little more than 10 times as much uh, with one third as many uh, seed, color, seed bugs, 5.7 times, times the 16th. Uh, if you look at that as terms of inoculation rate, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is actually measured, measured uh, bacteria in the five day pond. They average right at 1 million and then uh, with the new program right at 10 million. 45,000 pounds a day of BOD removed before, 67,000 pounds removed after. COD was a little bit higher. And that, that's another example of where COD and BOD aren't, you know, that aren't always exactly the same. Uh, the residuals, we cut the residuals in just about half. And the overall bio, they have a bioindicator rating that, that we, they look at and we look at that rates it from one to five. And uh, subjectively it was, I think it went from a three to a two. Uh, this is the first time we've ever had any data where we actually could kind of prove the impact of throwing bugs into a system. Uh, part of that's because we really probably had never thought about really looking at it from that perspective, but also before we really didn't have the capabilities to do that. Some of the new technologies that we have allow us to do some of this. Um, we didn't have a lot of data beforehand, but we did have four data points over a, about a three month period where consistently the five day effluent pond and what they call the five day effluent pond is after that diffused air system. Uh, it was between 10 to the 5th and 10 to the 6th. And then once the system was up and going with the new system, it consistently ran mid 10 to the 6th to low 10 to the 7th. So roughly one log increase in terms of bacteria in the system. Uh, uh, this is actually what their environmental manager put together. Uh, they did save money, they reduced costs, they improved their efficiency. Uh, they felt like it was simpler. A couple of things he thought of that I hadn't really thought about, and it's, it's somewhat, it's, it seems minor, but I guess it's real. One of the things was safety, and his, his point was they cut their nutrient use by about 30%, which meant they had 30% 30, 30 fewer nutrient trucks come in. Well, they were getting a nutrient truck about once a week, so that went from 52 deliveries to 35 deliveries. Well, that's 15 times a year. You don't have to worry about, you know, somebody spilling something on the ground. Again, that's not why you make decisions aren't necessarily, but those are the little things that, that come into play, uh, particularly in this environment where we're really, really focused on doing things that are safety and, and minimizing risk. Uh, this is just the cost numbers. Uh, one thing that's, that's good to do, um, and you can do this with your aeration costs or anything else, is you can translate your treatment cost to a pound, dollars per pound of BOD. You can do it with your nutrients, your aeration, your, your bugs, um, and that kind of takes some of the the year-to-year, day-to-day, month-to-month variables out. Um, this is monthly dollars per pound of BOD removed. Um, you know, in you know the the previous eight or nine months or 12 months, uh, it didn't range anywhere from 0.12 up to 0.3. Uh, during this period of time, when we started this program up, it ranged from 0.08 to about 0.17. Um, and then this is just some. This is pounds of BOD removed and efficiencies. And this is some of the safety things that, that the, the environmental manager uh, put forth. So just kind of summarize the, the, the biogmentation portion. It doesn't replace or, or ah, try that one more time. It doesn't replace proper design and operation. It doesn't supersede the laws of science. You know, we, we don't do anything that's, that's uh, that unique in that standpoint. There are some situations where it makes sense. Um, place you can get bacteria, neighboring plant, similar plant, and commercial cultures. The thing, the, thing, the thing that takes these two out of the equation for most ASBs, it would make no sense at all to go get somebody else's ASB water and bring it to yours. There's not enough bacteria in a single <laughs> truckload of water to do any good at all. And there are, there are very few municipal or industrial activated sludge plants or pavement activated sludge plants that are close enough that you would be able to even go do that without the bugs dying before they got there. Um, so for ASBs, it's really not feasible to, to use borrowed bacteria or, or uh, donated bacteria. For activated sludge plants, it's a little different story. Um, and when, when we start up an activated sludge plant from scratch, for example, a brand new system, the approach we take is we actually take our reactor and we blend it with sludge from, a, from an existing plant not so much because we want the bugs from the existing plant, because you really don't get that many bugs, but you get some solids. And those units out there grow up dispersed bacteria. They don't grow flocks. We don't want them to grow flocks. We're trying to grow as many dispersed bacteria as possible. 
Well, and that's fine in ASP because you're going to generate whatever flock can generate before it gets to the end. In activated sludge, we want to, it's very important we grow flock. So what we'll do is we'll take uh, a truck, you know, three or four truckloads of, of municipal sludge or industrial sludge and we'll make that our, our carrier, if you will, and then we'll use the, the back technology to grow as many live viable bacteria as we can to blend the two together. Okay, I hope that kind of brought, brought things together a little bit from what we talked about for the last two days before today. Um, the uh, you know, ASBs are kind of kind of interesting and when I first started working in this field you know 20 whatever years ago there were two schools of thought for ASBs. One is their poor man's activated sludge and everything that was written was basically activated sludge technology dumbed down and simplified and nutrient residuals anything that was written was just sort of like it was like activated sludge for dummies and the other thing is, is they were treated like big holes in the ground that nobody needed to pay attention to, and they, they worked and they just kind of ran along and you know, nobody worried about them. Well, that worked for about 20 years, you know, until you know, most of these ASBs were dug in you know, 1970s, early 1980s, whenever the, the permits got issued and they had to put in a wastewater plant. And then all of a sudden they started filling up, started filling up. They, their retention time got shorter, permits got lower, you know, and in the 2000s, the collision kind of happened between those two events, and people started realizing, oh, we got to get those solids out of there. We got to take care of our aerators. We've got to do things, and so, and we've started learning things about, you know, in working with Dr. Lang is it's a very complex microbiology out there. Um, there are hundreds of strains, and there are zones of aeration. There are zones of the of the basin that run at low ORP that actually function with this type of bacteria and that type of bacteria. Now, we still can't always affect change with those things very easily, but we're learning that they are pretty, they're just as complicated in some cases as an activated sludge plant. The difference is you have very few levers to pull on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, your operator, there's only so much an operator of an ASB can do. He can go out there and count the aerators that are running, write work orders when they're not running, make sure the nutrient pump is running, uh, you know, look at the primary clarifier, make sure that the blanket level is not too high and that they're getting wasted out. Look at the screw press. You know, there's just not a lot of things they can do, but it's very important. And that's why some of this other stuff is important as far as tracking these comprehensive studies that, you know, we started doing for you guys, you know, three years ago. It was based on a meeting that, that Chris and Al, Adam and I had after a presentation. I said, well, what if we did these corporate-wide every three years on a rotating basis. I said, yeah, we'd love to do that. And, and the premise was we can't afford to get in a situation where we're on the verge of being out of compliance and the answer is to dredge out nine million cubic yards of solids when that takes a year and a half to do and you're out of compliance now. So trying to stay ahead of the game is, is the key with ASBs. Because as I showed yesterday, they, it's kind of like they bend and they bend and they bend and when they break, it's usually not something very simple to just go out there and fix. You've got to, you know, spend a lot of money in a short period of time to get back in compliance. Questions, requests, complaints. Okay.